couple of the principles, Jamie, that aren't going to betray you are having a high savings rate, investing early and often. And if you kind of stick to those principles, it's hard to mess this thing up. I have never met anyone that has said, oh no, I oversaved into my retirement accounts. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast, where every episode is all about achieving financial independence in the military faster than before. We believe personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. Building wealth can be simple, and financial freedom is the ultimate financial goal. Now, here's your hosts, Spencer and Jamie. Today's topic on the Military Money Manual podcast is gap funds. What to do between early retirement and the age at which you can access your retirement accounts. Welcome back today. This is Jamie, and I'm here with Spencer Reese from MilitaryMoneyManual.com. And if you do enjoy the show or any of our shows, we appreciate five-star reviews on Spotify or Apple. And as always, you can reach out to us on Instagram at Military Money Manual or via email. It's podcast at MilitaryMoneyManual.com. So Spencer, if someone's never heard of a gap fund, can you give us a quick explanation of what it is? A lot of people get tripped up on this because they're like, I'm saving all this money into my retirement accounts, but I can't access them till age 59 and a half, but I want to retire at age 40. So what do I do? I think it's kind of this preconceived notion that like, once the money goes into a retirement account, you can never access it again until age 59 and a half. And as we'll discuss in this episode, that's just not true. There's actually a lot of ways to access those funds. And some of them have a little bit higher taxes or what some people have started calling penalties. And some of them don't actually, they don't have penalties on them. So we're going to talk about those tactics and how to access the money that's going into your retirement account. But let's say that you're lucky enough to you know, be an officer in today's military and or a dual military enlisted couple. And you're making enough money that you're not only maximizing your Roth IRA contributions and your Roth TSP contributions, but you still have money left over and you're putting money into your taxable brokerage account. So essentially what a gap fund is, is it's money or cash or investments that are there and can be accessed outside of retirement accounts before age 59 and a half. For some people, if they're retiring at age 40, they'll need the money to last for 20 years before they can access their retirement accounts. But that's actually kind of a misconception because you can access your retirement accounts in other ways before age 59 and a half. And we'll talk about those on this episode. So the gap is the age gap between when you stop having all your income, military retirement or whatever, and your 59 and a half. That being said, Jamie, military retirement, you might actually have enough income to support your lifestyle or a significant portion of your lifestyle. I think what a lot of people, you know, out in the civilian world, pensions have almost completely gone away, or at least pensions that you can earn after 20 years. The military is still very unique in that, hey, if you give them 20 years of service, even if you're under the blended retirement system, it's a 2% multiplier per year. 20 years of active duty service is going to equal 40% pension of your base pay. So you have to ignore all the other special pays you have in there, your BAH, your BAS. It's only based on base pay, but it usually works out for most people to be about a third or a quarter of their total compensation before they retired. So let's say you're making $100,000 a year in their 20th year of active duty military service. When you retire, if you're in the legacy system, you can probably count on, a, on about a third of your pre retirement pay, so about $33,000 per year. But if you're under the BRS, let's just estimate and say it's about somewhere between twenty five dollars and $30,000. And so even for our non-military retirement earning listeners, which on average, most of our listeners will not make it to earning a military pension, if you're still interested in stopping your full-time income before 59 and a half, potentially anyone could have a gap there, not just with a military pension or early retirees of, you know, if military people tend to at, retire around 41, 42, maybe as early as 38. Uh, so there could be a large gap there or it could only be a few years there. So your military pension is one way to fund it. What are some other ways, Spencer, where we fund our gap? Let me back up real quick. When I say gap fund, it could be investing. It could be some other options. Or how do we set money aside to cover that gap? Yeah. I mean, the simplest thing, Jamie, is just whatever your investment strategy is for financial independence, just continue to implement that investing strategy outside of your TSP, outside of your Roth IRA, and just keep it going in your taxable brokerage account. 
So for me, let's say I've got about 80% or I think it's like 75% of my portfolio in the US stock market. So in the TSP, that would be the C and the S fund, Charlie and Sierra fund. In my Vanguard Roth IRA, it's the simple VTI, uh, Vanguard's Total Stock Market Index Fund that covers all publicly traded uh, companies in the United States. And guess what? You can go buy VTI in a Vanguard taxable brokerage account. In fact, because it's an ETF, an exchange-traded fund, you can buy VTI at Fidelity, at Schwab, at Robinhood, at just about anywhere that you can trade. And you know, we talk a lot about maxing out your TSP, maxing out your Roth IRA. But once you've done those things, then you can keep squirreling money away into your taxable brokerage account. And some of the benefits there is it's extremely flexible. There's no penalties for withdrawing money from those accounts other than if you have short-term capital gains. So that's a asset that you've held for less than one year that's treated as taxable income and you'll pay a much higher, you potentially will pay a much higher rate on the sale of that asset than an asset that you hold for at least a year where you'll pay long-term capital gains tax. And depending, that depends on how much money taxable income you make a year, but up to $47,000 of taxable income in a year, if you're single, is a 0% long-term capital gains tax. So you can actually make a substantial amount of money. So let's say you have $200,000 gain on NVIDIA stock and you make $40,000 a year taxable income, you could sell the entire $200,000 of NVIDIA stock as long as you've held it for over a year and you'll pay zero capital gains tax on that. So that's pretty awesome. Hey Spencer, I have a question on taxable brokerage accounts for a gap fund before we move on to other funding options. You mentioned after maxing out. Let's say... Is there ever an opportunity where someone might want to start funding a taxable brokerage account for their gap fund, even if they're not able to max out their traditional retirement accounts because they know they might be okay at traditional retirement age, but they need something to cover the gap? Could the order shift a little bit? Yeah, I I think that kind of falls into like a coast fi territory. So that's a coast financial independence. And essentially what happens is you have filled your retirement accounts to the point where you can just kind of, you know, do a Monte Carlo simulation or use like a, you know, 7% after inflation growth rate. And you can put into the calculator and realize like, okay, if I've got $400,000 in my Roth thrift savings plan at the age of 40, that's going to double two more times before I can access it at age 60, possibly even three more times. And so all of a sudden, now you're looking at, what was that, 800,000, 1.6 million, and then 3.2 million? So now you're looking at a $3 million retirement account, and it's Roth, so you're not going to be paying any taxes on it. So you might be thinking, look, I've saved enough money into my retirement accounts. I need to be able to access some of, or I want to be able to access some of my money more easily. And so I'm going to put, start putting it into my taxable brokerage accounts. I would say it's that's almost more of an advanced strategy. The the tax benefits of retirement savings accounts is so valuable. And for most people, you know, they might hear about financial independence, they might hear about FIRE, but even if they're on the path of financial independence, it's a very rare person that isn't doing any income producing activity. Even if it's as simple as like they make some stuff and they sell it on Etsy or they do something in their community that generates some kind of income. You know, you look at like somebody like Jeremy Schneider, right? Like he sold his company for a couple million dollars and what is he doing now? He's starting another company. You know, that's, that's a very common thing, not just only in entrepreneurs, right? Even in like military and government employees where, okay, you're done with the military. Well, (laughs) now go work for the federal government for 20 years and earn a second pension. I think it's pretty rare that you have people who are completely retired, generating no income at all at a very young age, right? At, at like 40, uh, 30, you know, mid 30s, 40s. But it does happen and, and, it, and it could happen. That's okay. Like you can, if you've got the plan and you're like, no, look, I've saved money into my Roth IRA and I'm not going to save any more because I projected it out and I know how much I need. The other thing that I'll talk about really quick with funding a gap fund is the Roth IRA account. You can withdraw contributions to that fund at any time. So you've already paid taxes on that money. So let's say that 
you know, you saved in a Roth IRA for 20 years, $7,000 a year contribution limit. We'll say it was the average over that 20 years. Now you've got $140,000 in there. That could fund a couple of years of your FI lifestyle. And you can withdraw those contributions at any time as long as you don't touch the earnings. So, and we'll get Penalty into it even more. Too. Penalty free too, exactly. And we'll get into an even more advanced strategy in just a little bit about how about Roth IRA conversions, also known as the uh, Roth IRA conversion ladder. But yeah, I think you know the taxable brokerage account can be an, an excellent way to to fund your quote unquote gap fund. That's a strategy that I use myself. And Spencer, a lot of times on the show we talk about the four percent safe withdrawal rate. Can you clarify where the gap fund comes into play? Does my balance or my FI number need to all be in a gap fund in a taxable brokerage account, or can it be my total net worth or total investable assets? That's a great question. So, you know, a lot of people get hung up on, okay, well, if I've got money in my TSB over here, in my taxable brokerage account over here, it's not compounding as fast as if if it was in one account. Like we talked about on a previous episode, Jamie, that's just a misunderstanding of the distributive property of multiplication, right? If you have two accounts each with $500 in them growing at 10% a year. Okay, that's 50 bucks a year. Well, if you can combine them into one account and the account has $1,000 in it growing at 10%, well, that's 50 plus 50. Oh, that's 100 bucks. It doesn't matter where your money is as long as it's all invested in a similar strategy and it's all, it's all growing at the same time. So your 4% rule is comes from originally came from Will Bergen, I think was the author of the Trinity study. And basically he, in the 1990s, they looked at all the 30 year periods of the US stock market from like 1928 to the late 90s. And they said how much and the worst time period is 1968. If you started retirement in 1968, you were absolutely hosed. And they actually used a 60, 40, 60 percent stock, 40 percent bond portfolio. And what they found was that in Every single circumstance, you could withdraw 4% of your invested assets and you would never run out of money. Now, you might end up with a dollar at the end, which is a little close for some people, but over a 30-year time period, they found that if you withdrew 4% of your invested assets, inflation adjusted too, though, that was the other thing, is it it could grow Mm -hmm. over the years by inflation, then you would not run out of money. So, what the personal finance community has done is they flipped that 4% rule on its head and they said, okay, so let's say I want to spend $40,000 a year. How much do I need? Well, you can either divide $40,000 by 0.04 or that's too hard. So we'll just multiply it by 25, right? And $40,000 times 25 is a million. And oh, what's 40, you know, what's 4% of a million? $40,000 a year. Boom, there you go. 4% rule or 25x your annual spend, and that's your FIRE number. That's your FI number. And I talk a lot about that in my book, The Military Money Manual. So how does that work for someone who actually retires early? You know, Even if they have a part-time job or whatever, let's say they retire at 30, that 30-year timer starts at age 30 to age 60 or 59 and a half when they can access their funds. We can take our Roth IRA or Roth TSP contributions out. But other than that, it would have to be in a taxable brokerage account to have access to. Is that what you're saying? No. So you can have the funds between retirement accounts, between taxable and brokerage accounts. In the military, a lot of times we have VA disability payments. A lot of times we have military pensions. And when you get to age six, between age 62 and 70, you'll be eligible for social security. And so that's income that you can deduct from your 4%, your 25X number, because you don't need to save to generate that much income. So let's say that you're you know, your budget is $50,000 a year just for easy numbers. And let's say you get $25,000 a year of VA disability payments. Well, you can either just keep spending, you know, now all of a sudden your budget's $75,000 a year, or you can just say, all right, well, rather than having to save 25 times 50,000, which is 1.25 million, you could just say, I'm going to save half of that, which is math in my head real quick, 600 and 600,000, 612,000. There you go. So, but yeah, that's the, that's what the, you know, the power of additional income sources. And that's why a lot, a lot of people, Jamie, like real estate. So a lot of people do like real estate because, you know, it could potentially generate rental income. And when you're generating income off of real estate, you're not including the real estate asset in your 4% rule because that's a misinterpretation of the 4% rule. It's your liquid 
net worth. It's your liquid investable assets. It's not money that's tied up in, you know, a lot of times people will like work backwards and figure out how much their pension is worth and then use that as part of their 4% number. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Just look at your pension as a source of income and deduct that from your living expenses, your living expenses minus your pension. Now that number is how much 25 X that number is how much you need to save. So same thing with, if you have rental real estate property, let's say it's generating $10,000 a year, your lifestyle is $100,000 a year. Well, now you need to, you can just subtract those two numbers, 100 minus 10, and now you need to generate $90,000 a year of income. And how do you do that? Well, 4% rule, 90 times 25, it's somewhere around $2 million. Just a quick note from one of our sponsors, and then we'll be right back to the show. Hey, Spencer, I got a cousin that just graduated from high school, and they're about to start basic training in a few months. Any ideas on a gift I should get them? Yep, sure do, Jamie. The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom, is a concise, easy to read and practical guide to your military money. It's the book that I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In the book, I explain the exact money tactics and investing strategies that can enable you to achieve financial independence while serving in the U.S. military. It's available on Amazon, Audible, and my website. It's hardcover, paperback, ebook, Kindle, and audiobook. You can get a special discount using promo code PODCAST on my website, shop.militarymoneymanual.com. Okay, so during our gap year, we have taxable brokerage accounts, potential real estate, uh, VA disability, military pension, and even part-time worker consulting. A lot of military uh, veterans or retirees jump into a contracting job. You know, They go back to Afghanistan as a contractor or whatever. I think those opportunities will always be there. What we find is a lot of, especially early retirees, tend to be really over saving. It's kind of one extreme or the other for a lot of people we talk to. They're saving way too much. Their math is being way too conservative, and they're not able to enjoy life while they're younger because of that. Any other military-specific considerations? I think you mentioned VA disability already. I'm not sure if there's any anything else you want to hit. On the military side... No, I I don't think so. I mean, a guard reserve opportunities as well. Let's say that active duty, you know, you didn't enjoy 20 years in active duty and you, you punched early. Well, you can keep going with the guard and reserves and you can earn a guard or reserve pension, which could kick in at uh, at 60 or possibly even younger. You know, you can drive that number down through a variety of factors that I'm not 100% familiar with, so I'm not going to speak on them. But there's definitely ways to earn guard and reserve pensions as well. And you're not going to earn the active duty pension that kicks in immediately, but you can earn those pensions. And then that's income that you can rely on when you get to the more traditional retirement age. It doesn't help you in the meantime with those gap fund numbers, but it's something that you can think about where it's like, okay, maybe I spend a little bit more of my gap fund when I'm younger, like a 5% safe withdrawal rate, rate, because I know that when I get to this certain age, this additional income source is going to kick in. So I asked some AI for a joke about gap funds and VA disability compensation. So you guys will like this one. Remember those aches and pains from lugging a hundred pounds of gear might just pay off. I don't know if that's <laughs> I don't know if that's a joke. I think we have some work to do on AI. Okay. Spencer earlier you mentioned advanced gap funding strategies and the Roth IRA conversion ladder. I know on the pack podcast before we talked about C D ladders. Is that similar and what's an IRA conversion ladder? Yeah, not very similar to a CD ladder other than, I guess you have the... The word ladder, have, that's it. Yeah, and you have to spread out the conversions over a number of years. But essentially what you do is during your income years, you contribute to your pre-tax, so your traditional retirement accounts, so your traditional TSP, your traditional IRA, and you retire early. And then you get your money into a traditional IRA. So if you have a traditional TSP, you would transfer it to a traditional IRA. And then you would convert from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. You'll have to pay taxes on that conversion. So you want to be careful with this. Again, this is another time it might be worth talking to someone from hellonectarine.com slash r slash military if you want to get 10% off their advice only CFPs over there that understand the military lifestyle. Also, Military Financial Advisors Association, MFAA. You can Google them, militaryfinancialadvisors.org, I think is their URL. And once you convert your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA, you'll have to wait five years before you touch the converted money. But once the five years is up, you can withdraw the conversion tax and penalty free and then just spend it. <laughs> it's just It just goes into your bank account out of your Roth IRA. And 
and it doesn't, it, it's basically looked at as like a contribution. Remember how we said that if you contribute to your Roth IRA, you can always withdraw your contributions. Well, after five years, it's just treated, the conversion is just treated as a contribution. You can pull it out. So what a lot of people in the FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early community have done is they've come up with a whole system where they're like, okay, I'll fund my traditional IRA, my traditional TSP, my traditional 401k. I'll roll it over to a traditional IRA. Then I'll convert it to a Roth IRA. And I'll do this every year. And after five years, I'll be able to take out that first year that I did. And I'll be able to keep doing that. So now all of a sudden, the only gap you have to fund is that five-year period between when you did your first traditional IRA to Roth IRA conversion, that's the only gap you have to fund is is a five-year gap. And all of a sudden, that makes things a lot easier, right? Because now you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about saving as much money into a taxable brokerage account or into a high yield savings account or, you know, into some other account outside of retirement accounts. You can still focus on your retirement accounts and let's say you have a very traditional early retirement where you don't have a military pension and you aren't earning any income, you can convert a lot to your from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA and pay very little taxes. In fact, JB, I just ran the numbers on this. Let's say that you converted $100,000, okay, from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA, you'll pay an 8% effective tax rate. You're only going to pay $8,000 in that conversion. That's crazy. That's if you're married filing jointly. But I'm just that just blows me away that you know with the standard deduction of $29,200 this year in 2024, your taxable income is only $70,800 and you're only going to pay $8,000 income tax on that. You know, that's a great trick. That's literally like a little hack right there. We were listening to this great Choose FI podcast the other day. I'll have to get the exact number for it. But they were saying the CFP who they were talking on there, if you know everybody's all spun up about taking withdrawals from their Roth IRA above their contribution because there's a 10% penalty. But he made the point that like the IRS doesn't call it a penalty. They just call it a 10% tax. It's just an additional 10% tax. So let's say you pulled $100,000 out of your Roth IRA and you paid 10% on it. Okay, like that's, that's fine. You'd have to pay tax on the, I think you have to pay tax on the earnings as well. But, you know, let's say the earnings were like $50,000 and the additional tax was 10% on that. So the income tax on $50,000 is $2,000 plus the additional 10% of, let's say you pulled out $100,000, another $10,000. Now, 12, now you're, tax you're paying is $12,000 and your effective tax rate is 12%, that's still pretty reasonable for a 100,000 withdrawal. You know, don't be afraid of contributing to your retirement accounts. I think that's like the big thing that I want people to take away from this is that they get hung up on building this gap fund. And it's like, are you maxing your Roth IRA? Are you maxing your Roth TSB? Because until you're doing that, those kind of things, I wouldn't worry too much about the gap fund. I would worry more about increasing your savings rate so that you can take advantage of building these awesome retirement accounts where you don't have to worry about taxes. And like we talked about in the RMD episode, Jamie, it might be not only benefit you, but it might benefit whoever the beneficiary of your account is because they're not going to have to worry about taxes on that account either. Yeah, the Roth IRA conversion ladder conversation reminds me of episode 118 we did back on March 31st of 2024, where we went over some advanced personal finance topics for high net worth military families, Roth IRA conversion ladder and backdoor Roth and conversions and things like that can get tricky and feel a little bit overwhelming. But the big thing that I the takeaway from what you just told us, Spencer, is that we have to have a plan, but it's not something that we need to worry about too much. And especially for military families that have options for other income, or in some cases, a military pension that you may not need to stress out about it as much as some people do. We get pretty regular questions, maybe about once a month on gap funds specifically, I'd say. And a lot of times people are like, you know, how do I do it? What, where should I put it? It's like, there's a lot of other things to worry about in your financial situation than stressing about the gap fund. So focus on your savings rate, focus on things like that. There's a lot of things out there that also can play into this, like health savings accounts, depending on what type of insurance you have after the military, that may or may not be a factor. But your gap fund is an option of how do you fund your lifestyle until traditional retirement age. And there's a lot of options that you you talked through uh, with us today. 
like you said, people get kind of hung up on it. Like, oh, shouldn't I be saving like outside of a retirement account? And the answer is really no, no, you shouldn't. The Roth IRA, you can, like we said, you can touch those contributions at any time. And the tax benefits of those, especially those Roth accounts, they're too big to ignore. And if you're excited about the idea of FIRE and you've gone and you've like plotted out your whole life and you're like, you know what, I'm going to make traditional contributions and then I'm going to do a Roth IRA ladder and I'm going to save in my taxable brokerage account so I can fund the five-year gap between when I can take my first Roth conversion Roth uh, conversion ladder. And it's like, great, good luck. What is it uh, Patton said? Like no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Well, no financial spreadsheet survives first contact with reality. I mean, it's exciting and like it it can be motivating to to plan out like, okay, like in 10 years, I'm going to be a millionaire. And then in 20 years, I'm going to have $2 million. But you never know like where life's going to take you. So like have a plan and be like directionally accelerating or traveling in the direction of your goal, but be flexible and recognize that things are going to change. Your life's going to change. People get sick. People think they're going to do 20 years in the military and they they don't. They do a couple enlistments or, and then they think, you know what, I'm going to move on to something else. And the couple of the principles, Jamie, that aren't going to betray you are having a high savings rate, investing early and often. And if you kind of stick to those principles it's hard to mess this thing up. I have never met anyone that has said, oh no, I oversaved into my retirement accounts. I've never seen that on any personal finance, early retirement website where they're like, I've got too much other than they'll say that when I've got too much in my retirement accounts because they've like put a million dollars into their 401ks and their IRAs, and they're only like 40 years old, and they like run the numbers, and they're like, oh no, I'm going to have like $6 million to fund my lifestyle after age 60. Like what a crazy problem to have. So I think I can see that, like make sure you don't oversave. But at the same time, if you're even aware of what the concept of FIRE is, you're so far ahead of every other American consumer out there who's just blindly driving their Suburban to Costco to load up on another $1,000 of junk. Spencer, this has uh, been really good on on gap funds. It's one of those topics that I feel like might be hard for people to tackle or understand exactly their situation. We mentioned hellonectarine.com or uh, MFAA. Uh, Do you ever make yourself available for topics like this? I've started doing it recently, Jamie, just kind of a beta test. So if you're listening to this in the future, no guarantee that I'm still doing it. But yeah, for a limited time, uh, militarymoneymanual.com slash mentor, M-E-N-T-O-R. You can book a uh, hour with me. It's going to cost a little bit of money. I got my prices listed there. I've got a little form you can fill out and we can basically talk about any kind of money topics. Uh, I've had people who wanted to talk about career starter loans when they're on their way to pilot training. I've had a couple that separated recently from the military and they were looking for some advice on uh, a VA loan and moving back to their hometown. And I've talked to a couple that they're coming up on transitioning out of the military and they just kind of wanted a gut check on how they're doing on their path to financial independence. So the one thing that a lot of these people who have booked calls with me, the number one book I recommend is Die With Zero because a lot of people have very impressive savings rates And I just want to make sure that they're prioritizing living in the now as well and not just delaying gratification forever. You know, like Bill Perkins says in the book, like, when's the party? What are we saving for here? And just make sure that like, you're not saying no to things now when you're younger that don't cost that much in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of energy. But there are opportunities that just will slip away. And then you've got three kids and, and a wife and a full-time job, and you're just not going to be able to go you know, skiing with the boys on the weekend. So make sure that you're thinking about those kind of things and you're not just living in the spreadsheet. You're getting out of the spreadsheet. So yeah, militarymoneymanual.com slash mentor. And you can book an hour with me on there. You can see my availability. I've got a calendar up. If you got any questions about booking time with me, Spencer at militarymoneymanual.com or Instagram at Military Money Manual. And listener, if you got 
value from the show, the best way to say thanks is a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We're almost up to 300 Spotify reviews. Get after it. If you get the 300th review, you can screenshot it and send it to us and maybe we'll send you something, maybe some swag, maybe a Amazon gift card. I don't know. We'll see what we can dig up. And then Apple Podcasts, well done. You finally cracked the 100 barrier. So we've got three digits over at Apple Podcasts. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Military Money Manual Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Military Money Manual Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. The views and opinions presented here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of the DOD or its components. Reference to any commercial products or services does not constitute DOD endorsement of those products or services.